Do you let me to wait for more participants to join, Laura? You can start recording from 12.5, please. To respect your time, I'm starting the presentation. Hi, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join this discussion. Welcome to the second lecture on the quality improvement series in the joint CME program by Larkin Community Hospital and Florida Medical Association. I thank Larkin Community Hospital, Larkin Health System and FMA for supporting us in planning these credited lectures. I'm Dr. Sima Arzwan, physician, PhD in health system administration and MPH in healthcare leadership with more than two decades of experience in clinical practice, academic research, teaching and executive responsibilities. In the previous presentation, we looked at quality gaps, areas where we can work on improving the clinical environment through quality improvement projects. We learned how to identify quality gaps, like evidence to practice gap, gaps in patient management, equity gap, practice workflow gap, documentation and communication gaps, and leadership or management gaps. Those were headings of our last chat, of our previous chat. Now we are moving forward to the point where we realized and selected the gap, the problem as a topic of our project, and we plan to start creating quality improvement teams and projects in our department. In that phase, we need a supportive culture to empower and enable us for a change. Today, we discuss the key challenging part of quality improvement projects, which is the team and organizational culture that is literally needed for any change in our environment, in our practice, and in our workflow. Let me ask a question at the beginning of this discussion. Quality improvement projects are supposed to address a chronic problem scheduled for solution. So we are addressing a problem to find a solution and then implement, implement the solution and measure before and after intervention uh, outcome measures. We should measure something. Imagine we realize right problem, right gap. Selected that, put it in the center of our graduate scholarly activities, and develop the intervention and reports for it. Is the problem solved by identifying and highlighting the issues? Will problems be solved by designing interventions like team or patient education, adding a test or exam or medication to our practice, does it work? Or adding a form or checklist, does it work? How the results would last for the long time when the resident or fellow who is working on the quality improvement leaves our department, leaves us. Even if the re resident measures the outcome before and after uh, intervention to be able of writing a quality improvement report for graduation purposes, does it work for our department? Would the change last in our practice with patients and clinical teams? Would it impact our practice and healthcare outcomes in, among our patients? How do you think about contextual factors like employees' acceptance, employees' acceptance of the change, awareness of our team members, thoughts, interests, wants, and resistance? What about the standards and policies? What about our payment mechanisms? What about leadership strategies in our organization? How those factors affect the quality improvement and the outcomes of our projects. Dominant culture in the department affects the results on quality improvement project. It can be a change promoter 
or a culture that resists to save the status quo. You know what's the status quo? A status quo is saving the current state of the things that people are making advantages of that. And people are likely to keep that situation instead of changing the situation. Are your efforts for change the current situation always going as you expect? In this lecture, I'd like to discuss the underlying factors of the team or organization that facilitate, stop, or slow the change. We will talk about solutions that enable us to prepare our team and colleagues to keep up with evidence-based changes instead of showing resistance to that. In this lecture, we will review these items, this outline, significant changes that happened over the last decade, and uh, it motivates us to be changeable and up-to-date systems thinking, how to share the vision among the stakeholders, how people around us accept the change. What about the people who are late late fans of the change and lag guards to change and they resist over the change. Using change co concept and understanding the psychology of change. Psychology of change help us if we know and uh, be being able of doing something psychologically for the change to support the change, it would help us. Technical challenges and adaptive challenges, eliminating waste, improving workflow, patient engagement, time and data management that helps to promote the culture of change, error proofing and incident reporting and team formation. Learning objectives are focused on continuous changing culture, necessity of physicians involvement with quality improvement projects, program directors, faculty to guide, residents and fellows and other physicians who are a part of the quality improvement. Systems thinking is very important in uh, the quality improvement projects and a stakeholder engagement. A part of a stakeholders could be patients, clinical team members, uh, managers, leaders, IT people, nursing departments, appropriate use of scientific and organizational resources for the change, and creating and conducting the teams, not individual, because individual working on quality improvement doesn't work for the long time. It's only a scholarly activity and writing a project. And after that, we would lose all of the results, all of the force and the time that has been spent on the project. Okay, let us start with the last decade changes that has been happening. In the last decade, events have been taken place that has dramatically changed health services. Everything has been transformed from the epidemiologic burden of disease, which had a significant focus on what? On chronic and non-infectious disease before the pandemic. All of us were thinking about how we can control the chronic disease like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and all other chronic conditions. Not, nothing was in the center of our efforts in developed countries about infectious disease, a virus, but it has been changed drastically. To the changes in the method of visiting and communicating with patients, which was in-person visits and has been changed to telehealth and virtual visits, also huge changes in the advanced treatment options for chronic diseases that is now seen in the margins of the COVID-19 virus. Before that, it was in the center. Right now, it's in the margin, but it has been changed dramatically. Considering those continuous and extraordinary changes, we have to be competitive and changeable. For what? for a standing among peers, for the survival of our individual and group businesses, or beyond that, beyond the business and competing purposes 
for responding to the emerging needs and priorities of the community, of the patients and families. If we continue the repetitive routine and traditional way of working, we cannot stay in the market and we will lose our customers and are uh, confident as well because the current market needs confident people, capable people, advanced people with uh, innovative solutions. Pandemic, telehealth, telemedicine platforms and applications, artificial intelligence and big tech companies, big tech companies, presence in the healthcare market are few examples of those huge changes in healthcare industry. Amazon is setting up initiatives to transform pharmacy, medical supply chain, health insurance, and care delivery. Amazon is leveraging its delivery power to transform the medical supplies distribution space. And Amazon uses its massive employee base to test the telehealth. Google is using its dominance in data storage and analytics to direct the medical knowledge. All of us experience that, that Google is directing our uh, decisions, our interpretations, our access to knowledge. So it is using the dominance of data storage. And AI, artificial intelligence, has led these companies to have the public opinions aligned with, with their you know, directions and priorities. The company is leaning on its cloud platform, artificial intelligence to land the strategic hospital partnerships by solving issues with EHR. That's something very new that Google is partnering with hospital EHR to solve their problems and issues in terms of interoperability. I don't want to discuss those terms that is uh, functional in IT, but they are working. They are working on computing infrastructure, on leading the public opinion on everything. So we should be aware of these huge changes, being changeable, being updated, and ready to change our system and our services. In addition to the huge changes that have been placed in market, continuous quality improvement is a pass to viability that is important to our professional survival in clinics and hospitals. The most crucial part of viability is the culture of innovation. Culture of innovation, transformation, and adoption with the rapid change process. Let's take a look at the profound changes that have been taking place around us, around physicians, around clinicians. Did you know that organs that can be transplanted with living tissue have been 3D printed? 3D printers now are printing organs, like what? Like liver, like uh, skin cells, like blood vessels. Gene editing technology to modify someone's DNA to treat disease instead of treating the symptoms. Gene editing technology has been used for cytosol anemia, has been used for skin tissue disorders, connective tissue disorders, has been used for restoring sight and vision, for blood clotting proteins in patients with hemophilia, and to treat symptoms of aging. This technology in the recent decade got bacteria treatments using the gut bacteria microbiome therapy for many types of disease, in, um, including diarrhea, life threatening infections, inflammatory bowel disease, IB, IBS, and also cancer, metabolic disease, mental illness, autoimmune disease. These are things that are happening around us. Cancer therapy by immunotherapy, several types of immunotherapy, cancer fingerprinting, that is a new approach to analyzing how specific cases of cancer react to different treatments. So those are new things. Those are things that are happening around us. Everything is a change. 
everything is a transformation in the healthcare system. Artificial eye that works wireless sends the messages into the user's retinal implants. Non-surgical treatment of cataract by Meltaway cataract treatments. Artificial pancreas. Implantable probobuffin to treat opioid dependence. All of, all of these are other examples with drastic changes in research-based treatment options and methods. Only treatment systems remain in competition with the market and the customer, which are improving in accordance with changing environment. That is viability. That is how we can survive in this market we can improve our confidence, we can improve our network, we can enhance the number of patients who are coming to us and relying on our advanced treatments and solutions. This means that we must be dynamic and changeable and constantly adopt our training and treatment systems to the developments around us, to the developments in the market. Okay. The challenging part of these changes is cultural change for, for having ad advancement in our context, in our workplace, to support quality improvement projects, to support evidence-based practice, to support improving our services for the patients. And the human affair, the human interactions with the change is the most challenging part of that. We all believe that research to find new scientific solutions, new clinical solutions, it is not an easy task. All of us are familiar with clinical research, for example, for vaccine, for having this vaccine, corona, coronavirus vaccines. How many clinical trials have been done? How, how much? effort and time and energy have been spent on it to find something. I mean, every single step in the advanced solutions that we mentioned in last slides and thousands that we don't have to talk about them, none of them were easy to achieve, but it is crucial to know. It is important to know that improving the services and manage, management of the patient and the clinical teams in a changing environment is much more complex. Working with teams to improve their, their behavior, to improve their style of services is much more complex because of a need to understand human behaviors. When you want to change the, the patient behavior, it's much more complex than writing a medication or prescribing a medication for her or uh, him to go to pharmacy and have it. But changing the lifestyle is much more problematic. Why? Because human behaviors are complex. Human interactions are complex. And complex decisions for new situations like using electronic prescription for practice, remote working, vaccine mandate, or currently, those are human relevant behaviors that are much, much complex than, for example, creating or invent, inventing a new vaccine. Wherever human dis decisions and human affairs are involved, the work becomes very complicated. To have a culture of imp improvement in medical services, we need principle and systematic thinking that is to understand the current problems are not the direct product of one or more linear causes. Each complication is directly and indirectly affects by several factors and uh, everything is two-sided. Everything is complex and interactive because having different people in our workplaces, different people with different opinions, with different interactions, with different thoughts and beliefs. So 
we need to know that the reaction of different stakeholders is complex and unpredictable. And to achieve the best results, we need to look at the problem from the perspective of different people. We should understand our people. We should explore how they think and uh, how they believe about the change, about anything that we are trying to change in our environment. We need a systematic approach and tools for system systems thinking. It's very important to think systematically instead of linear. Okay, human aspects of the change that are important. The first one is power struggle, where you shape a team, you form a team, and uh, you share the vision of change among them. You should outsource and grant the power to people to do the things. But power struggle and how, how the capacity of the people who receive their power and how they use that power for, for, for example, their personal interest or organizational interest, for departmental mission and change for the patients and, and families or for their close friends and relationships. So power struggle is a thing that always challenge the efforts for improvement. It's very important to know your people and the team that you are engaging with the change is very important to be capable person, to be person who have the capacity of sharing the power and to, be, to rely on them and to, you know, uh, dedicate and grant the responsibility and power. Lack of buy-in, too much changes at once. Healthcare system is experiencing too much changes simultaneously because everything is being changed with this pandemic particularly. Everything is changing. So it, it's too much for our employee to understand the, the, the changes to cope with them and keep up with our strategies. So confusing strategies, leadership challenges, everything can be a challenge that human, human team members and human affairs that are involving and engaging with the change can react to the change in different ways. So we expect to have everything uh, straightforward, but in real practice, it doesn't happen because we would have a lot of problems in practice. Also about systems thinking in medicine. Let us discuss what's difference between linear thinking and systems thinking here. In linear thinking, for example, for medical approach, we consider two or three factors such as abnormal insulin release, high insulin, impaired glucose tolerance, that these are factors that cause diabetes development. But in systems thinking, this is not the case. Diabetes is the product of hundreds of components affecting the body, the biology of the, of the patient, like lifestyle, active life, home environment, workplace, nutrition, mental health. Let us see how, and I want to uh, emphasize these models. You see here linear thinking that A causes B. This is the causality. We can think in this way, multiple causation that A, B, C, and D causing something. But systems thinking Systems thinking help us to understand how different factors affect each other. At the same time, they are affecting linear, the other factors. So this is very complex way of thinking, how different causation, how different factors can affect other factors and interact with each other. Let's see what's the meaning of this in diabetes. This is the meaning of systems thinking in diabetes. 
you see here that life course, genes, body system, mind system, active life, human environment, local physical environment, health services, everything is influencing cardiovascular disease and diabetes systematic approach. So this is the thing, this is the system that trains our brain that nothing is a direct result of a special cause or even multiple causes. Nothing is the direct outcome of causes like insulin or uh, tolerance to insulin. There are many, many other factors that affect, and this is the holistic approach to patient. This is a holistic approach to patient. Systems thinking is a problem-based approach that anal analyzes an issue within its system, surrounding elements that interact with the problem or are affected by the problem. And together from an interactive, interactive multifactorial complex. Relations and effects are not linear but are like loops, you see here, everything is like a loop because, because body system affects, affects mind system, mind system affects body system. And at the same time, they're affecting other factors. So those are like causal loops with positive or negative influence. Systems thinking concepts uh, is also used in management and operation science. We reviewed its implication and its meaning in medical approach. Diabetes and cardiovascular system was medical uh, problem. How it is functional, how it, how it works in management. In management, uh, it is used across a range of industries from healthcare to other industries. It's also known as systems-based practice. The key premise of the systems-based practice is viewing an individual practice prescribed to a patient within the overall system of the healthcare. The overall healthcare system is shaped by a number of interdependent smaller systems, interdependent smaller systems, physician systems, pharmacy system, hospital system, and many more. Understanding issues as the result of multi-factors that are interacting with each other helps us to heal the patient's problem with a holistic approach and solve hospital or clinical clinic problems with a systems approach. At the same time, we should understand about many factors, the factors out of our circle, like the changing environment and stress that comes to our hospital, for example, for a pandemic, and then how these subsystems are working together. One of the essential factors in change culture and culture of change is sharing the vision among the stakeholders. When you want to start a project in your department, in psych department, dermatology department, in surgery department, it's important to share the vision among the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? Program, fa program faculty, program director, program coordinator, nurse, nurse of the nursing supervisor, administrators of the case managers, Ev everyone in front desk of, of the department, the people who are managing the administrative forms and processes of the patient management, everyone is a stakeholder there. So if you, if you want to change something, you should share the vision among the stakeholders. So how it works with establishing a sense of urgency, we should articulate a powerful rational for the change that, for example, people, bringing people around the table and then explaining what's the issue that we are trying to change something. What's our main and objective for changing the current situation? Even if it is something like, for example, um, a long uh, wait line, a waste in time, a waste in medication, or a missed component in our, uh, labs, 
in our, for example, test, paraclinical test, or anything that, that you think it's an issue, it's a problem. So establish a sense of urgency first, then build a coalition. It's important to have a team with enough power and influence in the department to change something. None of our residents can change something individually. It's important to understand it that we, should, we shouldn't be alone for these type of changes. We should have someone from other residents, from other departments, from our uh, leading team in our department, program director, a faculty who supports us, a supervisor, a nurse who is working in our department, a physician assistant who is working, collaborates with us. So we should have someone to help us to understand how it changed the process within a collaboration and creating a vision, communicating the vision, why we are doing this change, why we are changing this form. What is this trigger tool? What is this terrier system? What is this new educational program that we have developed? Or what is this new form in, in the IT or EMR that we are adding to the current situation? If you communicate the vision and create the vision and empower others, removing obstacles and barriers and plan for uh, creating short-term wins, many of these quality improvement projects have long-term outcomes, but we should create something in the short term to show people that how it affects the system, how it influences our outcome measures. It's important to consolidate improvement and institutionalize change, make it sustain. So this is the way that we can share the quality improvement mission with the uh, team members who are collaborating with us. And this is the health quality culture a culture that focus on safe care. Safe care doesn't mean, for example, patient fall, only patient fall. It's a part of safety, but anything that doesn't benefit the patient and we are doing for the patient, that's a safety warning. If patient doesn't benefit from this procedure and we are exposing patient to, to additional X-ray, we are exposing patient even to one other station of the, of the one other touch point of the healthcare services because of, for example, risk of uh, COVID-19. Anything that doesn't benefit patient is not safe. So effective working, safe working, patient-centered working, understanding patient, understanding their views, efficient working, using resources, as much as is necessary for that care. Timely and equitable, all of those is a part of health quality culture. How it happens with engaging patient and public. Engaging patient, what is patient engagement? It's not only um, educating patient. We will discuss this later. Let me, let me discuss it later. So patient engagement is important. Redesigning the system to support the quality care. So we need supportive system for quality care. It's not easy to change the things and then say and be sure that, okay, we have done these quality improvement projects and now system is better than yesterday. No, it would be better if you support the change, if you uh, develop and empower the teams that are working on change and uh, make it something sustainable through culture of change. Help professionals and caregivers to try. Ensure technology work for, for people. So alignment of the technology, alignment of the EMO and IT platforms with, with our goals and objectives in quality improvement is very important. Support innovation and spread knowledge, monitor and, monitor and reward. It's very important to reward these efforts. To, to make positive feedbacks to the people who are trying for that. So those are important components of the culture of change. Again, a resident or faculty alone cannot succeed in breaking about lasting change. 
even if that change is to add a clinical test to the routine patient management processes with a specific conditions. Every improvement requires a team that is leading the change, have a shared vision and is committed to mobilize the system. So shaping a vision, mobilizing commitment and changing, you know, leading the trans transition from current state to improve the state is very important for quality improvement projects. This is another model that helps us for uh, having a culture of change with different um, components here. It, please compare it to the last one. Creating sense of urgency, we had it in the last model. Changing leaders and other key players. Why? Because we need people who are supporting us, who are early adopters with the, with the change. I will discuss who are early adopters with the change. Being a role model, if you want to lead the change process in your department, in your program, it needs to play a role model, play a role model for other residents, for sub interns, for other people who are working with you. Train, training is an important part of this change and change the rewarding system because the compensation, the payments, those are the things that stabilize the change. If you reward positively the people who are innovating in the system, who are advancing the system, developing new solutions in the system, it helps other people to understand what's the value of advanced work. If, if we don't change the rewarding systems and feedbacks and keep it traditional, we, we cannot expect others to work, to work in, in a modern style and advance evidence-based practice for everything. We should change the rewarding system based on their performance as a, as a uh, change agency, as a change agency. Create new stories and symbols. For example, all of us have some history of our departments and programs. We have a history in, for our workplaces, but creating new stories about people who have done advanced solutions, who have added additional and value adding steps to our work. Th that's important to, do, to build role models for our medical graduates who are training in our system. That's very important to create new stories, new champions for the people who are around us. This is the story of people and how they react to uh, innovations to change. Innovators of the first two and a half percent of a group to adopt a new idea, okay? The next 13 and a half percent to adopt an innovation are labeled early adopters. So already we have 15 percent of people who, who are supporting the change, who are supporting new innovation. You are bringing a new software to the to the program. You are adding a new uh, checklist or triage before, for example, admission of the patient or transition of the patient. You, you have a trigger tool to, to do uh, those tasks. You already have 15% of the people who support this. Innovators are eager to try new ideas and late majority, late majority, and laggards are acting like the break for change. So it's important that we have we have 15 50% of the people with us, and we have 50% who might resist them, re resist uh, for our changes and for our advanced solutions. So when we start the quality improvement project, we already have those. 15% and 35% with us. We should plan for the late acceptance and resistance of another half of our people. So we should plan how we can keep up with these people, how we can change their mission, how we can change their idea, how we can have these people with us, not to resist and not to waste our energy, but we should know that this is something natural in any, in every system that tries for change, tries for quality improvement. 
we, sh we will face two types of challenges if we try for quality improvement in our system. The first challenge is technical challenge. The second one is adoptive. What does it mean? Technical challenges are clearly defined. They can be solved by experts like physicians and can achieve gains in short time frames. For example, administering medication to lower blood pressure is a technical approach. So you can, you can change the way of prescription. You can cover people and prescribe and administer the medication for lowering blood pressure. That's a technical challenge. If you identify this topic, you can try to change it. But adaptive challenges are harder to identify, must be solved by the people affected by the problem and requires more time. How, for example, inviting patients to change their lifestyle and diets is an adaptive one. Because I told you very well, humankind behaviors and lifestyle is a part of the change, is a part of the solution. The work is very complex. You can add a form in your EMO, in your EHR system, but asking people and inviting people to work with that form accurately and appropriately is something very complex. So it would be adaptive change. Everywhere that you want the people to collaborate with you and support you, to keep up with your ideas and opinions, it would be something adaptive. So it's important to know that most quality improvement projects require people to take new approaches to both technical and adaptive challenges. How we can overcome these two types of challenges with having a good team, a good team, a capable team. We should activate people for change. How this activation happens with understanding that there are many reasons for people to resist change. What are those reasons? Fear of losing control, excess uncertainty, unease with surprise, and fear of losing status quo. We talked about the status quo that is keeping the things that right now we have, even those are minimal, but just keep it, save it, keep this current situation because if you lose it, you will lose some benefits in the future. This fear keeps people, those 50% of the people to resist change. How we can change the situation, how we can activate the people with granting power the ability to act with purpose. So selection of right people who don't abuse the power is important because when you share the power, you should, you should rely on people to use it appropriately. So granting the power is important and courage is the other thing that emotionally motivate people to keep up with your ideas and new plans and quality improvement projects. The other thing that helps us to understand resistance is having this tool, you know, to uh, brainstorm with our people, with our team, to draw and develop a list of helping items, helping people and forces, and hindering or resistance forces or restraining forces in our environment. So this helps us and we can call it force field analysis for every change we need it. Even if in our family, we want to change something. So we need to, we need to know what's, what's the perspective of these people, particular people, what's the perspective of others? What, what are, for example, the uh, budget barriers? What are financial barriers? What are uh, relationship barriers, emotional barriers, everything should be, should be understood first before the change. So it's very important to have a true understanding of, of force uh, field analysis. And this is when I am inviting you to have a contribution in two minutes. Please unmute your speaker and share your opinions about driving 
or supporting factors and hindering forces for guideline implementation at Larkin teaching hospital programs. Do you see anything that supports our idea for clinical practice guideline implementation? And the other things that uh, are barriers to implementation of those guidelines. Can you please unmute yourself if you have any idea? Does it make sense? Please, Nazish. I think when, um, when we start thinking about implementation, I think the, the good thing is that all healthcare professionals are very cooperative and it's very helpful. Um, I have noticed that they are all up for bringing positive changes and they, they're very helpful. So that's a very positive thing. Great. That's the positive thing, that everyone wants to, to practice evidence-based mm -hmm. because, because of the professional ideas. What about uh, hindering or restraining forces, the barriers to that? I think one of the barriers would be time. Um, if you want to implement something, you need to talk to different people. And then that takes time. Uh, everyone is busy, especially in healthcare. Um, so you have to coordinate with everyone and figure out who's who has time to talk to you and figure out if they can implement the changes. So I think time is one of the hindrance. Thank you so much for your contribution. The other thing that can be a barrier is, you know, uh, having all people aligned with a type of protocol is something that limits the freedom of choice for physicians. When you are free to diagnose, when you are free to prescribe based on the best practices and you know the training that you are receiving, it would be something much you know, easier than um, having uh, obligation or requirements for being aligned and adhere to a specific protocol. So that could be a barrier, but we should know both of them accurately and then design and plan for that. So these are different type of activating agency strategy to activate people individually, to activate people to work together as teams and to activate the system. System is structures, processes, and conditions, the policies that are working in each department. So if, if we activate only people for doing that, like residents to do quality improvement projects, it doesn't change as much the hospital environment or, or the results for patients and families. We should engage them with interprofessional, with working together and uh, changing system, the policies and processes and teaching mechanisms, training mechanisms to activate all of them. Let me try this film. If you can hear, please let me know. Can you hear the voice? No, Dr. Seema. No, Dr. Seema. We cannot hear it. Okay, so you can't hear. Am I right? No. Okay, okay. Let me. <laughs> you can find uh, that video. I, I should change the advanced uh, setting of the software. You can have access to those YouTube videos in IHI. Uh, Institution for Healthcare Quality Improvement or Healthcare Improvement, IHI website has many of these YouTube videos that are uh, training and educational, but it describes this cycle again, that unleash intrinsic motivations, co-design people. What does it mean? Co-design means bringing people who are end users of the system around the table to develop new plans. For example, if you are trying to develop a system 
for uh, patients with a specific condition. It's better to have them in your planning committees, a representative voice of patients. If you are planning something for residents, it's better to have representative voices from residents. If you are trying to educate, for example, sub-interns and develop a better system for them, it's better to engage them. It, it is called in, in, in the systems thinking and QI project, it is called co-design. Co-design means the use end users and customers view in your designing, in your quality improvement projects. And these are the other parts of the cycle that you can access in IHI website. Now is the time to state and develop a people-driven aim statement for a co-design. So how we can use it? We, we talked about co-design. That is a process that uses creative and participatory methods to understand the needs and ideas of the people. How we can do it when you write a statement that uh, explains who are doing this quality improvement project. We, for example, are co-designing with whom so we are co-designing with ICU patients and families. To do what? So the aim of the project to decrease length of a stay for ICU patients. How? By 50 persons. So you see in the quality improvement projects, we should have a precise, precise aim that is measurable. In which duration, the time frame, nine months. By what, how the changes will do it in order to achieve something. So this is the aim statement in a co-design project that can be something as, an, as a good example. Eliminating wastes is the other part of the uh, change culture. So waste of overproduction, waste of waiting, transportation, everything that doesn't add value to our customer, everything that doesn't add a value to our patients, waste of motion, a lot of motions, for example, wasted materials, movement of the people, from one place to another place, inventories, time that we spend, people working in processes that are not important to the customer, extra steps in a process, repeated work, parallel work, repeated work, using more stuff than required, all of those can be based. And these are examples of the based. For example, adverse events and complications, Adverse events and complications in an inpatient setting. Readmission is a waste. Healthcare associated infection, central line infection, those ventilator acquired pneumonia, those are adverse events that are waste of our energy and costs. Inappropriate use of clinical services is another type of the waste. For example, unwanted services. CT scan or MRI instead of X-ray, longer than expected length of a stay, unnecessary hospitalization, those are waste and delays also are waste of our energy and time. Workflow is the other thing that we should keep in our mind. 40% of clinical office work is redundant or otherwise wasted effort. 40 person. So we can we can change the style of our work. For example, stop taking messages, looking for a chart, for a repeated phone call, preparing for, for an office visit, 
and the patient doesn't show up for that. Those are waste of energy. We can change the style of our services. And patient engagement. We talked about it in our slides, but now this is the definition of patient engagement. Patient engagement is when patients are actively involved, not passively. Passively means you are prescribing, you are educating, you are asking, you are requesting, and, and patient accepts and agrees, listens to your recommendation and receives something. This is the passive way. But the active way is involving patient in their care, considering their valued decisions, informing them for having the power to engage and involve to help you in your decisions. And that is called shared decision making by the patients. So patient and doctors should make shared decisions instead of paternalistic decisions and top-down decisions. That is a passive patient engagement. Educating patients for understanding their personal needs and requirements. That's something that is two-way and active. And also relying on the data when you are developing the data system and you are informed with the data, you can develop a culture of change that is data driven. If you have your department, for example, incident reports monthly, it's a data driven culture of change. Then you can prioritize the topics of the quality improvement in your department. If you have data about the residents' opinions and views in your department, if you have data about the patient views and preferences in your department, then you can develop a culture of data-driven quality improvement in your department. So the next group of factors that affect the culture of change is learning from incident reporting. If you have this type of data, for example, diagnosis errors, missed diagnosis, delayed diagnosis, incorrect diagnosis, medication errors, blood products related errors, procedure errors, failure to perform, wrong procedure, wrong body side, post-operative complications, Failure of procedure, post-operative infection, delayed treatment, not provided treatment, complications of the treatment, failure to treat, and many other things, things about failure to warn patient about a consequent adverse event, failures to keep patients uninfected and safe, device failures, everything. If we keep this data inside our department, we can claim that our system is safe. And the team formation is the last slide. I emphasize during our presentation that team is very important and how to create the team. I advise uh, our residents and liaisons that uh, create and shape a research committee in their program. Research committee can promote the culture of change inside each clinical program. So if the team shapes and forms with interprofessional activities and uh, having three to five residents in each quality improvement project to work together because we told about interprofessional work, we told about interpersonal relationship and its role and necessity for the quality improvement projects. So we should have a clinical leader in the team. We should have a technical leader. We should have someone day-to-day -day leadership and someone uh, who links us to the higher level managers. And this is how you can develop the quality improvement team by involving some of these people in your team. For example, the aim statement is this, 
redesigning something to improve outcomes for patients. Who are the team's clinical leader is a medical director. Technical expertise is, the, is an MD intensivist. Day-to-day -day leadership is an RN because of that. I always recommend people to, in, to uh, encourage and involve nurses in their routine quality improvement projects because it helps them to achieve the goals of the project. Additional team members, respiratory therapy, quality improvement specialists, research fellows, for example, a staff nurse, pharmacists, clinical nurse specialists, and a sponsor who is a chief operating officer or someone that links us, for example, with Dr. David Leskovitz as a, uh, someone who is a part of leadership of the hospital or someone who links you with us with our department or with GME management team. So these are examples of people who are help, who can help you in your quality improvement efforts. Okay, we discussed all of these items in this one hour and we learned how we can overcome the barriers, the barriers and the uh, obstacles by changing the culture for uh, the changing the culture and improving the culture for quality improvement purposes. Thank you so much for your attention and thank your time that dedicated to this presentation. Is there any question? I know that the time is over. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a very nice day. Thank, thank you, Dr. Marzma. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Marzma. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.